Yeah. All right. Um, let's get started. Good afternoon. Um, so do you have any questions about what we covered so far, especially on the synchronization stuff? So you're looking at synchronization um, and, and, uh, and the notion of synchronization and how you specify that or how you deal with that in various objects, right? And this is the continuation of, of that. Um, synchronization is one of the most important aspects of multimedia because I think I mentioned uh, way back, right? If you have one media, life is hard, but not as hard as if you want to have multi stuff, right? So if you, multimedia by definition has to have many different media. And when you have many different media, you, you get richer experience, but to specify and make sure that all of them happen in a seamless fashion, it's not trivial. And, and, and synchronization is one of the primitives which, which ties the different streams. So if you have audio, video, and all those things, how do you tie them all together in order to give you, um, in order to give you uh, a stream that you want, right? And as we pointed out, it's, so you want to know what limitations that like human beings can see and all those things, so we understand where we can slack off. So, so if you have resource constraints, where to allocate resources and stuff like that, right? The, the, the notion we look at today is the notion of figuring out how to model these things, right? How to model these things so, so I can specify what I want, and if you model them, then you can also verify if I'm, if I'm not giving you the stuff that I promised, right? So, so, so this become, makes it more scientific, so I can actually specify what, 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 what I promised, and you can verify if it's not met, right? And in, in, in general, whatever we study would have to be built into some sort of a tool that you operate on, right? So if you, example, if you're modifying a video using, say, iMovie or something, then you would have to specify these synchronization primitives somehow into those tools. If you're using, you know, there's a different set of tools out there to edit, edit video and objects and all those things. So you have to specify these things into that particular tool, right? Um, so you may not actually see the, the details uh, the, the, the tool may hide many of the stuff, right? And, 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 and whether it's a nice thing or a bad thing, the tools are still very primitive. So um, the, my sense from going to multimedia conferences and stuff like that is anyone who, who can attack this problem, anyone who can make these things a lot more seamless um, wins big, right? Because if you, if you, the, in terms of the sites that you see, you know, sort of like a YouTube and all those things, those are mostly sort of hard-coded, uh, hand-coded, and um, not necessarily uh, easier for normal human beings. So for example, if you want to put together one of these things um, over an afternoon, it's not that trivial, right? So you may have used iMovie for your first project. Uh, so you may have seen how it specifies who lets you import the video, right? Did any of you go beyond that to figure out what else the tool can let you do? So it's, it's a nonlinear editor, so meaning like you can take your video, audio streams, and you can place them or move them around. You can add add clips, you can add other stuff to um, to create effects, special effects and all those things, right? Um, so I, 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 I did one of those sessions, and I'll show you the screen screenshot of what how it looked. Now, of course, the tool can do a lot more, and um, iMovie is not exactly the, the most complicated apps you can see out there. So this was my iMovie screen, right? Um, so if you look at the editor, so you know, I, I took a little bit of, of some video here, right? And down here you have the editor, right? Where you can add and, and do stuff. So I, I, I clipped the, the clip to fairly small one. So if you can see, I don't know if you can see from back there. So essentially it shows a little video here. So this from here to here, is the video from the class lecture. But I added other objects, right? Um, so there's special effects. I mean, this one does, uh, I think, jet engine kind of stuff, and this one does uh, bells, and this one does uh, Star Wars kind of like uh, scrolling kind of thing. And you, you, you cannot probably see, but here, within the audio, I changed the audio from here to here to state slowly. I think I mentioned it before, so if you speed up the voice, you become more squeaky, and if you slow it down, you sound much deeper. So I kind of change those things here, right? But what I'm trying to 
do is what we are trying to look here, because for some reason I decided that this particular stream, right, which uh, which is generated synthetically, and this this particular uh, LDU, this particular LDU, this has to start here. I want it to end here. This has to start here, end here, and and I, I want something to change from here to here, change from here to here, kind of thing, right? So these are the specifications that we are we are studying today and stuff. So. I have all these objects. I want to create this video for some reason. I think it's it's uh, it's nice, and I want to add this stuff. And how do you specify these transitions and 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 and, and so on, right? Uh, so that it's not just a bunch of video playing on random, but things happen at specific intervals, right? If you want to see how it actually shows up once you render it. So you know that's that's one of the objects which are generated. Um, unfortunately, you can't hear the sound. You see, the second stream was added at some time, right? Um, in this particular case, it doesn't matter where it was, but if I was doing a real authoring, I may have to. I mean, decided at some point that these things should happen at a certain time, right? It's going very slowly. Yeah, this is what will happen if you if you reduce the yeah, if you increase the speed this is what you know they call it chipmunk right so you sound like a chipmunk so that's the process we were trying to see you know how do you specify all, all this stuff because if you think about the um, static things like like documents and stuff right we don't have to worry about uh, specifying the temporal uh, stuff uh, whereas in this case, I need to specify where the times are. And when you go beyond the stuff, you need to specify what quality you want. So if the resource is plenty that you can add all of the stuff, you're OK. But if you don't have resources, how do you allocate resources to the different stuff so that you still follow the synchronization model, but it's still a system? That's, that's the challenge. In the next lecture, we'll see how this is applied to really collaborative systems, uh, telepresence and, and all those things where you have multiple different objects and stuff, stuff like that. Um, right. So the so when you, when you talk about uh, the, the specifications, you ought to be able to specify it at different levels, at the media level, stream level, object level, specification level. Essentially, you go from low level to high level. And at each level, you deal with fewer components. So at the media level, you, you deal with a particular media. You say when the media comes into play and when it goes away kind of stuff. You don't, you're not talking about interaction between multiple media. But as, you, as the level goes up, you have more facilities to add how the, how, how the media, various media objects interact. Right? In the example I, I talked about, there is no explicit notion of how the different audio streams kind of mingle. Uh, but but when you um, when you talk about more realistic systems, you have to figure out how these things merge, merge right? So in the, in the case of the so at the lowest level, the media level, you're talking about how the um, how you specify the the, op, the a particular media, right? And the objects you uh, at the and the operation support at this level is basically read and write, essentially uh, read meaning um, encode or, or create the video, and write meaning show it on the screen, right? So you may specify something 
of, of this nature. So you know, so you're saying that I'm, I'm opening a particular device for output, opening a particular device for input. Again, these are more abstract sense. And I'm reading a movie, meaning like I'm, I'm getting this movie uh, encoded or, or from a file or what have you. And at, at some point, at, at this particular time, I want it to show a certain subtitle or another subtitle, and then I want this to go to the screen, right? So this is a way for me to specify that this particular uh, this particular movie, which happens to be from a file called file, and when it's playing at time 26 seconds, I want it to show the subtitle uh, subtitle one, and then at time 26, I want it to show subtitle two, and I want to show it on the screen, right? So, uh, so it, it, it applies to only to a media, and I can specify you know, some things about the media. It's not inter interacting with anything else. Right? Um, so next level is you, you talk about streams. So when you talk about streams, now you, you can uh, add the notion of other media which are part of the stream. Um, and and you, you're talking about, again, a con continuous stream. You're talking about uh, video, audio kind of stuff. And, um, so now, we, since you're, you're talking about two different streams, you have to specify how these two interact with each other. So it's not just specifying how the one media reacts by itself. You're talking about how the one media and the other media begin to interact with each other. Uh, so you, you still have to, you may think about giving notions of quality of service and all those things, but you're also trying to see how they synchronize, right? And the synchronization at this point, the problem is, if you just talk about the multimedia, the, the, sorry, the media level stuff, you may say at time 26, I should display this subtitle, right? But when you have two streams, and they have specifications separately, and if you couldn't keep up with one stream, and you couldn't display something at 26 seconds, right? If they're not synchronized, then your video will, if it goes on by itself, it may display the subtitles and keep moving while the audio is not catching up or whatever. So you're trying to merge these, you know, synchronize these two. Um, and again, it, you know, so it, it operates on different kinds of, uh, ob, you know, uh, different types of media, not just the media level objects, but other, other media like uh, images and, and, and stuff, stuff like that. Um, so at the object level, you go even higher, and sort of what the illustration I showed with, with the, what iMovie is doing, you're talking about different objects. Each object may have multiple streams, and you're trying to see how they interact with each other. And one of the language to specify those interactions is MHEG. And you can think of something like this as happening when you're playing a DVD, right? So when you're playing a DVD movie, you have the different um, media, the audio, and then you're trying to do the presentation, and um, and you specify what happens for each of those stuff, right? So at, at this point, um, um, yeah, so you specify the different capabilities and, and the presentation schedule of, of the different objects, right? Um, so the specification can 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 be at a number of different levels. We've seen a few few stages. It could be an interval based, time access based, control flow based, event based. And uh, essentially, what they're saying is, how do you specify the what is the reference frame for all these different objects? So how do you make sure that you know whether whether it's based on intervals between those objects or on absolute time frame or or what have you? But essentially, these are the ways you can specify how these how the different objects are are laid out. Um, and at, at, this is a sort of level that we, you know, we what, what iMovie operates in, right? And things become a little bit more interesting when you talk about distributed, distributed system, which is sort of what we what we uh, what we're looking at. So when you when you're talking about these systems, you want the um, so the, the the source or the destination may may be remote, right? It's the same. So, so essentially, so when you, when you talk about adding a network, you have to make sure that whatever specifications you're giving at the source is what happens at the end. So you, you want to have an end-to-end um, specification being able to uh, act on this stuff. Um, so this, that means that if you're talking about a different system, I have to say from the serving side how it should happen on the, on the remote side, right? So we can either think of the, the one way to do that is to send the synchronization information to the other side, right? So for example, if I, if I want to say something like this, let's say this is a video, this is the audio, right? At certain time I want to stop, certain time I want to stop, 
right? So if this has to be sent to the other side, I can say on the other side, you will get the video, you'll get the audio, right? And the specification which says when these things should start should be known to the other side, right? So either I can, I can send the information to the other side, in which case I can send them, send them like this, right? So if I, if I do something like this, then the other side receive the specification and it'll receive the video, receive the audio, then it'll recreate this like that on the other end, right? Because it knows that there's a, there are two objects and it knows the relationship because I'm sending the specification um, with, with it, right? So the other side can replay what, what it has to do. The problem here is now I have to send the specification with the stream, so it takes some space, right? Um, so I can either send it, so within even sending this, the specification, I can either send it like this, right? I can send it like separately like this. I can send this as right. Um, so I can send it either before the synchronization stuff. So I can send the um, I can send the specification before I'm sending the objects, right? So I can only do this if I know what this what I'm going to send in the future, right? So it's not possible for me to do this for objects that hasn't happened yet. So if it's a live TV or something, I may not know the specifications enough to tell you what what should happen, right? And also I need to send the the specification over the line wire to you. So you you're you're wasting network bandwidth. You are now have to um, so you need to get the specification so you can proceed. So for, for, for cases where I don't know the specification a priori, I can't do that, right? And so, so, so the advantage is a simple implementation, right? So you get the specification, you get the objects, you, you put them back together. The disadvantage is it takes you a while because till you get the specification and all these things, you can't really do anything. The other way is to do the out of band uh, stuff where I can send the specifications as soon as I find them in a separate channel. And the, the, the benefits are I can keep sending these objects and I can change them on the fly so I can do them on, on the, um, so you don't have to wait for these things to get through to the other side. Then the negatives are you need to have another channel, right? Um, so the another channel like we talked about in the, in the last lecture, um, in the network, they're all the same channel, so you have to figure out how this interleaving happens so that it, it looks like it's a separate channel um, so you can, you can still get the, uh, the timeliness, right? The, the thing to keep, keep in mind is if you don't have the spec, the other side cannot do much, so you, you want to make sure that once you have the spec, you can, you can send it as soon as possible. Out of band is a way to send that, right? Um, so the... Yeah, the other way is you can send it in within the sync, within the object. So you can send the the sync along with the with the stream as you find it, right? And the, the compared to the hard up and stuff, now you're fighting for the stream within the within the stuff. So if you have lots of data going through video data or something, you won't have the specification on the other end, so it won't be able to put them back together, right? So these are different ways of sending these things, and depending on what you're trying to do, you will choose one of this stuff, right? So if you're a DVD player, right, what kind of a thing scheme would you choose? So how would you, um, how would you, it, it, do you worry about these sort of constraints that you mentioned here, right? So remember for DVD, you have to have some kind of specification which says that I want to play, let's say, widescreen video, right? And I want to play, DTS audio, right? And I want to have this menu at the front when you when you play a DVD, it says set up and all those things, which figures out what, what happens, right? How do, how does the specification get to the player in a DVD? Is there a concern in, in DVD? Yeah. Well, I mean you already have everything known ahead of time, so mm -hmm. it doesn't 
Yeah, so since you have the disk with you, right, you don't really have to worry about it, right? Um, but it's not entirely true, right? I mean, depending on how you're navigating the system, you may or may not have all the spec, right? So the player can read all the spec or read them on the fly, right? So many players, you may have noticed that if you kind of press some buttons, then it'll kind of, you know, it'll start, the, the disk will go while it's trying to figure out what it should do next, right? So they tend to read, like say, the first screen and present it to you, and things will be ni nice and quiet. But if you pre press, like, you know, setup or something, then you see the disk going while, while it's trying to read the specification for what it should do, and then read the stuff, and then play and show it, right? So you don't have to worry about these concerns of how to get the stuff because it's there uh, on the is there on the disk, but it's not sequentially right next to you. So you, you pay the price of these things moving uh, around. Usually we don't bother because in the case of DVD, um, you're really worried about how the video, the movie plays, right? The, not the menu system. So even if the menu system is slow, even if it's doing lots of seeks and stuff, we're sort of okay, right? But you can see what, what it's trying to do because you know, it has the stuff. And whereas, but if you go into on the network basis, then things are much, much harder because if it's, you know, the, the, the delay between the player and the server, if it's, if it's long, that, that DVD seek can, can become slow. And that's why you, you worry about those, right? Um, so, and, and the other, other way to worry about this stuff is you can perform all this sync at the source or at the client. One other way to look at this is if this is a server, right? You have the sync specification, you have the objects, right? You can you can perform the the synchronization at the server and send them to you, right? In which case it doesn't have to send the synchronize the sync specification to the receiver at all, because uh, all everything is done on the on the server. Or you can do the sync to the client and let it play, right? Why would you choose one over the other? Why would you choose a case where the sync is on the server and not on the client? Right. Is the reason why you would keep the sync on the server? Think of the resource requirements for dealing with this, with the, the specifications. Right. If you do it on the server, then the client doesn't have to know about the specification. It doesn't have to do all the composing. It, it can be pretty simple. Right. So all it all it gets is it gets the stream, and everything is it's made for it. It just has to play it. Right. Whereas if you have to send it to the client, now the client is a little bit more smarter. It has more capabilities to understand what the specifications are. You pay the cost of sending it on the network, but it has to put them all together and then play it out, right? Um, so in some sense, your TV is sort of doing the server-based system, right? Your TV, all, so if you, if you think of like a watching a game and you have all these, um, you know, the scores and all those things added to, this, added to the image and stuff, they finish all the synchronization and all you, you're seeing is just the objects to be played. You don't have to worry about how the closed captioning should merge with all the objects and all those things. You know, th those happen at the server side, right? But on the, on the, the client-based system, you get all the stuff, then you're trying to re put them back together and then you can, uh, uh, you know. So the, so, the client-based system means that you 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 get you pay the network cost of getting the stuff. You have to have the computational knowledge to figure out how to deal with the specifications and and do what you want with it, right? Um, the 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 nice thing about the client-based system is, and as we'll see in the next few slides, depending on the, how the specifications are, the client-side system may be able to map what are the specifications to the actual hardware, right? So if the specification said this has to play for 30 seconds and something has to play for 10 seconds, starting at like 20 or something, right? If the client was couldn't keep up and it was actually playing this at, let's say, 33 or something, right? It's taking longer. It can correspondingly stretch the other objects 
because it's, it's doing all the management by itself, right? So it can figure out that even though specification said I should be doing it 30 seconds, but I had to do it for 33 seconds. So I can, you know, so it can make decisions on how these things should proceed from then on because it has the specifications and it's doing it locally, right? Whereas in a server-based system, the server is deciding to whatever it has to do. Uh, it, it doesn't consider anything at all at the client. So if things have to change, the server has to be involved because the client cannot do anything because it's not part of the equation, right? So depending on what, what your concern is, you, you move it into either our system, right? Depending on how much capabilities you have on the client, depending on how much network you want to conserve, and depending on what, what your system is, you either move it to the server or, or to, the, to the client, right? Does that make sense? And when you, when you, when you talk about the, um, um, the, these different stuff, we also have to talk about notions of clock and synchronization. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into detail into clock synchronization because it tends to um, become quite hairy, right? So the idea here is clock synchronization is if you're trying to do it at the server end. One way to do that is I can merge everything and send it as one stream. The other is I can send the video. I can send the I can send the video from um, so in the case zero to thirty and. Right. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to send the video from 0 to 30 seconds. Then I want to send the audio from uh, starting at 20 seconds, going off for 10 seconds. Right. So the, the challenge here is if I'm doing it from the server side, the server has to decide that at this point it's sending something over. And at when time is 20 seconds, it has to start sending the audio. Right. So the way it does that is it looks at its own clock to figure out when 20 seconds has happened and sends the, sends the object, right? Whereas this is a separate machine with its own clock. The, the challenge is how do you make sure that these two are synchronized enough such that the 20 seconds that you thought on the server is what you see on the client, right? What happens is if the, the network that you're sending is not adding uh, constant or delay, but if it adds more delay, right? So if you send something at the 20th second here, if that particular packet tend to get slowed down more in the network, so on the client it may happen that you see 0 to 22 because for the first so often the network was not delaying, but now the network is delaying like this. And let's say the network did not delay the next 8 seconds. right? So at the end you may receive it at 0 to the 30 seconds, but because of the network network delays, you really added um, some some extra time, right? And you, you uh, so so you lose the time here, right? And this goes into more relativity theory kind of stuff to make sure if you want two machines to be completely synchronized to to exactly happen, right? This time has to be constant, or else you have to have. The, the clocks on both the machines to be exactly going at the same uh, same uh, same fa speed, right? If you don't, you need to have reference clocks to make sure that these things are happening. Because otherwise, ma make, making sure that two events which are happening at two different entities to be working at the same exact clock, it's it's not possible. It's, it's not trivial. I mean, it's the you introduce notion of the general relativity stuff, right? So one way to deal with that is to use NTP clocks which is what now in machines do, right? Where each machine tries to find out how far it is by looking at other reference servers. And you, so you get pretty good synchronization, and that's what you use, tend to use on these systems, right? So if you have these two machines by themselves trying to operate, and you're, it's, it's, it's synchronized at the server side, and you're sending some, some time-based events, um, if you don't have control over the network, which we, we, we usually don't, the time that you, it takes to go across may be different, and there's no easy way for you to figure out how much delay happened along the way. Uh, the, the only way to do that is to synchronize both the clocks with the global clock um, through protocols like NTP or something to get, get what you wanted. Right? We're not going to go into the NTP protocol because that's, that's a separate thing. It's, but it's mostly a distributed systems concept. 
but it comes into a bigger play here because you are worried about time, especially when you're talking about multiple objects, which is how they're synchronous and all those things. Um, so that that's something that you need to worry about, right? You won't run into the problem if if I can send the specification over to the other side, because then the the clock is basically on the client side, and whatever time it's operating, it's good enough for it. And the other issues that, that the, we, we talked about, you have to worry about uh, all these parameters throughout the system. So you need to worry about when the objects are captured so it, it can be uh, added into the object. So if you're talking about uh, capturing a video from a camera, it's better to have the synchronization, better, better to be aware of this, the, the notion that objects are happening at a certain uh, pace and sort with the object. And it's better to pace it with every every aspect of it. So if you're retrieving some objects, you better have the you better be aware that there's a timing constraint. So if you have a something to be played within 20 seconds or something, you need to be able to read it at a certain pace. Uh, when you're sending it on the network, you need to have certain um, so it, it takes a certain amount to go there. So you have to make sure that all of them are capable of providing the service that you wanted, right? So in this particular case, if it took you for the then the 10 second stuff, if it took you 40 seconds to retrieve it from somewhere, right, and you're, you're sending it off, so if you, you might have sent the, the video object, the 20 second object first, but you're not able to retrieve the audio objects for, for another 20 seconds or something, then you'll miss the, the synchronization because you're not able to keep up with both of them, right? Uh, and again, you should consider them how it is at the sync. So you need to consider it across the system because any one of them, if they go out of synchronization, you tend to notice these things. Right? Um, and, and again, you need to worry about it if, when you have operations such as pass and rewind and all those things. So especially when you do a rewind um, or, or pass, you want to see how the, you know, how the timing of the ha uh, objects is supposed to happen afterwards, catch up with the stuff. Right? And again, in the rail systems, you may notice some, some delay here and there. So if you notice in your DVD player, if you stop the DVD, if you pass the DVD, right? When you start back, you may not start at exactly at where you stop, right? You may notice that um, many DVD players would buffer enough frames so that you can, it'll look like it's going off immediately, right? But frequently you see a jump because it, it loses synchronization. It'll, it'll get synchronization later on. Um, so you want to avoid, you want to, Keep that into the loop, trying to figure out what is acceptable, right? It's okay if it stops for a little bit. It's not okay if you go to the next scene, because that's that's something that you would tend to notice in the case of a DVD. Um, and we're going to go through the different me mechanisms that, that I saw in, in the previous slide on how, how you can specify the, the, um, the relationship between the objects, right? So the, the different models are interval-based, timeline-based, hierarchical, reference points, PetriNet event-based. I'm going to skip the PetriNet-based model. Uh, it's it's time-based. It's more um, uh, probabilistic model, right? So in the, in the case of the interval-based specification, so this is the specification language which tells how these objects are related. So in the interval-based model, you specify the relationship between these these two objects, right? So the relationships can be uh, A before B, B, B overlaps, I mean A overlaps A, A starts a B, uh, A equals B, and, and so on and so forth. Um, actually, we have the, the graphical representation of how what, what those are, right? So um, the relationship before, you know, for example, says that A happens before B, and you can augment it to say what the delay is, right? So by, by definition, right now it says A happens before B, but you could specify that the, 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 the gap should be two seconds or so, right? And you can say A meets B because you know they're, they're right next to each other, A equal to B because they're paying concurrently, and overlaps, and, and, and so on, right? So you would specify, so in, in this case, you would specify something like this, right? Um, so this sort of looks like what I have here, which says that this object and this object um, that this uh, A ends B, right? So the ending time for both of them are synchronized, right? How I could specify this as at time 20, this thing starts, which would be the overlap case, right? So through one of these mechanisms, I can specify uh, how these two objects are related to each other. 
Um, so in, in, a, in a more complex uh, example, the sort of this is how I would specify what happens here, right? Where it says that um, when you start off, the audio plays with the video, right? So over here, when the video starts, the audio also starts, and and if the user interacts, if they press uh, certain buttons, then you you do a certain sort of things, and you know for each of those, so you can say P P two is before P one, P three is before P two. So what it means is you know you you, you play P one, and when P one ends, you have to play P two, and so there's an implicit notion of when P2 should happen, except when, when P1 finishes, and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a specification language that you can use to specify one of these, one of the uh, time-based interactions, right? Um, the, the, the advantages of interval-based systems are it's easy to specify. Um, and it's, it's fairly flexible in, ter in terms of how, how you mo model these things. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard because it's, it's hard to include in the skew, right? It's hard to include um, how to specify the time relationship between objects except at, at certain intervals, right? Um, and it, it's uh, operations like this, you know, A is not in parallel to B would be hard to implement. Um, so it's simple for simple kind of stuff, but more complex scenarios, this may not be the way to go, right? Especially if you want to say precisely at this particular time, something should happen. Uh, these are these are not the way to go. The timeline-based system would be more suited for those, right? So here the idea is instead of specifying what happens to the different intervals with respect to each other, you choose a global time and re reference everything off of that, right? So you could say, I have a global time, and object one, so this should happen at zero, this should happen at 20, this should happen at 30, right? So I'm, I'm using a global timeline, I'm aligning these objects with that global timeline, right? And, and so the, the time-based time, time -based spec basically says when each of these objects should play across the time, right? The, the, the bad part about this is if this one was not keeping up, this one will go off regardless of what happens because these are these are not specified with amongst each other. It's based with the separate uh, time, right? The other bad part is it depends on the the time, right? So it depends on the person who's who's doing this uh, doing this playing. So if your clock tends to be slow on your machine, then it'll be slow playing slower, right? Or if you are not able to keep up and you're not able to uh, keep up with it. With, so it depends on your reference time, right? So you can either specify the time in absolute times or you can place it in a virtual time, right? So absolute time is sort of what I was, I was showing here, which, um, which is sort of what the iMovie uses in terms of add, adding these different objects. Virtual time is used by the, uh, the, music, the, um, the music charts, right? Any of you guys know how to read those things? The, the, right? So those are, are, are so the, 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 the duration between these is not based on time, right? It's based on how things play after each other, right? So you can specify in, in, in that model where you know how to translate from the virtual to the actual player model or in the model that we talked about, uh, there is absolute time that you're, you're operating. Absolute time, the problem is, again, you know, the, the time may not be exactly happening at the same pace. So if your machine happens to be going faster because your local clock is faster, the movie will be playing faster on your machine. Whereas in these systems, you're translating from the virtual clock back to the particular machine that you have. So you, you are likely to get experience the same um, feeling regardless of what, what machine you operate on, right? So again, those are different ways of, of specifying how these objects are related to each other. So the first one is the interval-based notion. The second one is the time-based uh, system. Again, you have to figure out what your base time is and how you specify these things so you can specify the relationship between objects. Um, the, the third one is notion of control flow-based, right? 
And one of the examples of this is a hierarchical system. So in this case, you are composing the different mechanisms to build higher level concept, right? So you can say if when one finishes, what should happen? So within each one of those, I can have, um, is it's a hierarchy-based system, I can say, so if it's a hierarchy of two things, I can say this is interval-based, this is time-based, and these two are related as one follows the other or, or, or what have you, right? So when you think of a DVD movie, essentially this is what is happening. So you have a certain tree structure showing you in the menu setup kind of thing, and when you plus, you know, playing the movie, you go into a different specification. Um, and each one of them can be specified differently, and you're building, you're composing higher level primitives on top of the, the base stuff, right? So for example, in the case of the, so this is the example of a slideshow. So when you're saying within this slide, I want all these objects I'm specifying in, in whatever mechanism I talk about. But when I press the, the, this button to go to the next slide, you know, I, I, I move from this point in this slide to this slide, then you have to show this particular slide, right? So I'm specifying the, the, the set of options which should happen for a particular slide here, the set of things that should happen for the next slide over here, and I'm specifying some sort of event to go across these schemes. So essentially you place from here to here, right? So it could either be because I press the stuff or because after a certain amount of time it goes from here to here. So I'm composing this as an independent synchronized object, this as an independent synchronized object, and moving from one to the other, right? And you can, you can think of more complex schemes. Um, and, and so in, in, in this case, when you have a interaction, then essentially you go from one to the other. But if you don't interact in this particular example, you're playing, you're, you, you're likely to play on the, you know, one, one end of the, of the tree. And when you interact, you move to a different object, right? So this is a way to compose the, you know, build much higher time specifications based on uh, simpler ones. And they have, uh, they have other examples of how you can um, specify these different, different uh, components and compose them into a larger scheme, right? And so in, in this set of the systems, you can specify when you go from the other one from one, one end of the tree to the other end of the tree, and those are called the synchronization points. Essentially, at that point, you can go from one to the other, right? So for, in the case of the, the presentation, when, whenever I press the button, it goes to the next screen, and the synchronization point is when I press the, the event that I press the button, right, to go to the next slide. And so it may be the case that once you finish the, the animation, you go on to the next one. So depending on how you, uh, you're laying it out, you, the transition may be defined for you. So in the case of the, um, of the slide, so within each slide, you have a set of options to happen, set of options to happen, but the translation from one slide to another slide may be through interaction or, or through recorded means. Um, and, and, the, um, and the advantages are, when you, when you, for example, if you're doing the PowerPoint kind of stuff, right? You're specifying the animations for each one of the slides independently, and then you're composing the interactions among these different slides. So it's, it's easy or intuitive to operate on because you treat each of them as a separate entity. You specify all the specifications for each one of the slides, and then you're only pre <coughs> presenting the transition across these slides. Um, the hard part is it's not very hard. It's very hard to look at inconsistencies, right? at the global level, right? Because now you're, comp you're decomposing it into two different problems, but if there's a global uh, inconsistency, you don't, you don't notice, notice these things, right? Um, and, the, and the next model is an event-based system, right? Event-based system is, event-based event systems essentially do certain actions based on events, right? So this is how you, you tend to program your windows or, or what have you. So essentially you can say when I press the button, some things happen, right? So you have a stream of actions going on and when an event happens, some things should, should happen, right? So in the, so for example, if you, you, know, you keep playing the movie till the event stop happens, in which case you stop, right? So 
the, the events can be you know, star pre prepare presentation or, or start or, or what have you. Um, and the events can be external or internal to the system. You know, external may be you, you, know, you interacting with the system. Internal may be after something happens, you can proceed to the, to the next event. Um, so the, the, you know, again, the advantages of these systems are um, you can add different kind of events, right? So in, instead of having the, the mouse, so in the, in the case of the PowerPoint, instead of having the mouse, I'm using this remote control thing. So somebody added the event-based system for this one. So essentially, when I press this stuff, you have the right trigger built into the slide, right? Because I didn't, I didn't make the slide react to this one, but somebody has to map whatever I'm doing here into the events that, that the mouse cursor is used to. Um, the, 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 the disadvantages is tend to be too hard, right? If you program something for Windows, right? Um. Windows meaning like Microsoft Windows or Mac, Mac, right? So when you write a program in an event-based scheme, how many of you write a, written a program in event-based uh, system? So event-based, so the, the control flow-based system, you tend to write something like, you write a program with the main, and then you continue to run it like this, right? Like a straight line, you know, your loops and uh, what have you. In an event-based system, you may still have a main as, uh, as for, for historical sake, but you basically say, um, let's say you you display this this screen somehow, right? And you essentially say, you say all the events that could happen on that particular screen, and then you program for those, right? So if you use your visual IDE tools, visual C or, or what have you, they, they create this template for you where essentially you have to program what happens when some event happens, right? So when you press a mouse or when you don't press a mouse or something. So you write your code based on what should happen at that particular instant, right? If you haven't done programming using this model, this is the sort of model that you use with the Visual C and all those things, right? Um, so for, have anyone written programs like these? So what do you think is the, uh, is this easier than the control flow model? Essentially the problem that they're talking about is what you see in an in a event-based system, right? What is the, one of the disadvantages of this model? Uh, what uh, are we it's, it, you don't really know like, the order of things that's going to happen. You know, it's all just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the user decides to do, whereas with control flow, it's all very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, there's no. I mean, it's, it's driven by the events, right? So it depends on you being able to predict what the events are, right? So if you don't know what the what the events that the user is supposed to press, so you are you are adding these events as independent uh, objects, but what happens is it's a symphony of all this stuff. So you want to make sure that all of them interact properly, right? So if, for example, if you forget to do something about mouse click, then your program would not react to the mouse click. So you might have noticed that if you write this program and if you forgot to add some code, things don't happen. If you forgot to code for a certain sequence of operations, then things will fail some bizarre fashion, right? Your program works for the most part, except when press, somebody pressed like Control S or something, it, that event may not have been canceled, you know, done very properly. So your program may work fine for a while till that event happens, right? It's kind of hard for you to debug because the debugger does not tell you anything about that you have this event flow problem. You have a problem where if that particular event happens, you don't react to it properly, right? Your, you see your, your code is valid, it's syntactically valid, you don't have any segmentation fault till that happens, and that's sort of what you happen here, right? So you specify all the all, what happens for the different events, but to debug them, to make sure that everything works fine, you have to try all these things, and if you forget something, things fail, right? And you actually see that for if you if you ever author a DVD, that's what happens. So right? it's so one of the nice things about using tools like iDVD and stuff is it fills all these defaults, so you don't have to worry about those stuff, right? But if you if you try to author a DVD by yourself, it's essentially as much of a pain as writing a um, Windows-based program without the help of editors and stuff because. If you forget something, then things won't happen. So for example, if you forget to react to the stop event, your DVD will not stop if you press the stop because it, you didn't program it, right? And that's the, that's the problem, right? 
Um, but it, it, so there are model editors that people work on this stuff. It's, it's nice because you can say, when I press play, wherever you are, you should play, right? Play the movie, because that's, that's an easy thing to explain. Um, so um, you, you try to add, add those things in. Um, there are more variants of this stuff. So for example, one of the things you may specify is you, you're showing a video, and if somebody clicks this more info, you want the video to change to more info about what is happening, right? So you have one video screen, and essentially the, the event flow is you, it continues to play this, DV, this movie here, but if you press more info here, then it should, it should start playing another video inside this box. So it's going from transition from one video to another video. Right? You see this in YouTube all the time. At the end, it says related video and all those things. So essentially, it goes. Uh, um, so you specify that as you keep proceeding with the one of them. Then if somebody presses, presses the more info, you play the next video. And it, it could be more reactive, where um, the user may not press anything, but it's, it's supposed to play these three videos next to each other. So it plays the first one at the end, it plays the next video, and so on. Um, so the event is ex, uh, ex, uh, implicit here. Right? End of one video means the other one. So within the same frame, you're playing these three videos. At the end, you play this, at the end, you play this. But you may interact with it more by saying uh, something like kitchen or something, right? So it's playing this video. If you press that button, it'll go to the next video in a nonlinear fashion. Uh, but essentially, you specify these things as you know, you start playing the first video, second video, third video. You interact, then I go into something else. Um, and as you can see, you know, as it as it becomes more complicated, as you as you you know, um, the specification becomes more complicated, things become much more harder, right? So now, now if you go back, to, if you look at your YouTube, right, wait till it finishes playing the video. At the end, it'll, it'll show up this video with all kind of advertisement related videos and all those things and you know, things sliding back and forth, right? What we're looking at is how do you do that? How do you specify that you play this video and at the end, I want to show all this, all this stuff which are dynamically generated. These are not encoded at the at the end, you're just saying, you know, these objects could be played and depending on where you click, it can go to different objects and stuff like that, right? So think so, you know, as X says, if you go back and look at your YouTube video and see how how rich the the system they built. It's not just playing the video that you wanted and then stop. It's it's actually um, it's a synchronized system, right? And the specifications of that is sort of what we kind of scratched here. Um, and I'll show an example of how this was applied to two different systems for the problems they faced, right? So um, what we covered is this, there's a vast amount of research. I kind of went through them fairly quickly. And you know, once you go through YouTube or something, uh, if you um, find any problems, let me know. We can sort of look at them on the next lecture. Right? See you on Wednesday. <laughs>